So Howie, what's it like doing an hour television show? It's a little different than your stand-up. Like, how does that for you? This is our band. What are you looking at? Cable. Just staring at cable? Welcome to Howie Mandel Does Stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. I'm his daughter, Jacqueline Schultz. And we have the brilliant Judd Apatow here. Happy to be here. Well, you know what? That makes me very happy because I, I know you, but I really don't know you. And I've, I've been a fan from afar. And I don't know that you even know this. Uh, do you remember the first time you and I worked together? Actually worked together? Kind of? Well, the I first do. time probably was I was a PA on Comic Relief. So that uh, that picture is the first I did not know that. <laughs> that was my first job. What at at Universal Studios, the first the uh, uh, the first one? Yeah, I worked in the office and I worked there for like 4 or 5 years uh, and I put on satellite benefits for for comic relief around the country. I would call up all the clubs and beg them to give the door on a certain night to comic relief and then during the show, my job the night of the show was to walk around and get every person on Comic Relief to sign 20 of the posters so we could sell them for charity. And in my office, I have a signed poster, which I stole for the, from the first Comic Relief, and your signature is on it. Well, so I have a picture that's the first Comic Relief, and when you think about who was there Crazy. that night, from Sid Caesar and Steve Allen to like every Shandling and all these other, I didn't know that. So I did, the thirteenth episode of the Ben Stiller Show. Do you know? Do you That's know that? right. Yes. I yes. don't think it aired. <laughs> well, it, it, it's on DVD. People can see it on DVD. But it was canceled before that aired. Your episode did not make it to official air, but I think it's out there. Like you can buy the Ben Stiller Show on. I don't know if it's on iTunes or something. But yes, that was very painful for us at the Ben Stiller Show. Is after twelve episodes. They said, we don't even want to air the 13th one. And Wait. then you won the Emmy. And then six months later, we Wait, won the Emmy. Wait, it stopped right before your episode? Yeah, my episode didn't <laughs> show. I, I'm the only episode out of 13 episodes that didn't show, <laughs> and they won an Emmy for amazing writing. <laughs> Judd Apatow holds the, uh, in, in esteem, and this is what I always thought, you are the most, uh, 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 pardon me if I, if, uh, and I mean this in the m most positive way, the, the most... He was the most successful failure in the sense that these shows were always my favorite shows, you know, whether it was Freak, Freaks and Geeks or whether, and there were some pilots that I heard that were coming out. Yes. You always, <laughs> but if you look at these shows that he worked on that were canceled or didn't go to a second season before all the movies and, and everybody, they were so amazing and maybe even ahead of their time. Do you, do you ever want to revisit some of these now? Well, I mean, it was a rough period <laughs> because everything kept getting canceled. And I was very young. I was 24, 25 when Ben Stiller and I did the Ben Stiller show. And I was just learning how to do everything. And I was very combative with the network. You were. Because they would give notes and, and the main person there didn't even like the show, but he would give notes. So how do you take notes from someone who doesn't like what you're doing generally? So how did you take them? What did you do? Well, once I said to the guy, well, I'm going to do none of them. What happens now? You said, to the, <laughs> you said that directly to the, real, to, the, to the executive? To the executive whose job was to give the notes of the person above him who, uh, who didn't like the show, the head of the network. Who and, was the head of the network at the time? Well, why do you want to call him out? I mean, he's been through so much. Okay, then forget it. <laughs> well, I, well, I just want to know. like, because That's always I, an interesting question. Do you want to actually call out the names of executives who've driven you crazy? I guess I lean no generally. But in my private life, I mention their names all the time. But isn't it interesting to, like, like we know now that you have impeccable taste in comedy and that's all subjective, but I think you do and you know what's funny and you know, I always think that the people at the network, if they really knew what funny was or they knew what good was, then they'd be making a lot more money by creating that, right? Yeah. It's, it's, yes. it's, it's much more satisfying to be on the other side. So you always hear about executives, you know, we turned down this movie and that became yes. the big box office. Is it bad? We're, how about the executive, what did he say to you or she say to you when you said, if I take none of the notes, 
<laughs> what happens then? What was the answer? Well, it's funny because that person was, was his first job, a gentleman named Steve McPherson, who later became the head of ABC. ABC, yes. But this was his first job ever, and he was very nice, and he was just like, seriously, you gotta help me a little bit. You gotta, you gotta take some notes just so I can say I got you to do something. And at that point, I didn't really understand that, that all of that is just some weird negotiation. It's just a game. Because the thing I learned was when you tell people that their notes are bad, they hate you forever and want to destroy you. Is like, that what happened? I think so. Because if you tell someone, like, I think your opinion is terrible, like, I don't believe in your creative instincts, then they can't go, you're right. Thanks for letting me know, Judd. I don't know anything about this. So... What else can you do? I will destroy you. And and they did. That's why they, they shut the show down. Like they had an order for 13. They didn't even air the last one. Do you think it was because you were combative? I don't know. But, you know, the show was on at 730 up against 60 minutes, which means in most of the country in the Midwest, it's on at 630. That's not the time for edgy sketch comedy. It no. was a terrible time. In fact, we so knew we had a bad time slot that Ben Stiller created all these commercials where he played an <laughs> excuse me, an agent, and he's talking to different celebrities who are considering going on the Ben Stiller show. Right. And as Ben playing an agent tells him, don't go on it, it's going to get canceled really quick. And, and he explained exactly, it's going to bomb, you're never going to beat Mike Wallace. So our ad campaign for the show was saying it's going to be a bomb. Which is leaning into it. and We <laughs> leaned into it. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, then they moved us to 1030 on Fox. And then after we got canceled, they gave back the 10 to 11 hour to the local affiliates. Right. So basically they said, we don't even want to program 10 to 11 on Fox. So not only you got canceled, the whole studio <laughs> no. network got we, canceled. We removed an hour of their programming day. <laughs> so that's just something to be proud of, right? Exactly. It doesn't, was an accomplishment. Doesn't all executives give notes? Like if they don't have any notes, then I feel like they think they're not doing a job. Have you ever had an executive that, because I know even from you, you're yeah. always getting notes no matter what, whether mm -hmm. it's great or not so great, or they love it, or they didn't even watch it yet. There's always notes. Yeah, people have notes. And you know, some people have great notes. And I think you spend your whole life trying to find people who get you. And if someone gets you, you can have an amazing conversation. I mean, we make almost all of our movies for Universal because they are really smart and their notes have been great. And we've had this 17 year relationship but other places like the second you hand it in and you start getting bad notes you're like oh no they don't get what we're doing at all and that and that's 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 the thing the only thing that keeps me up at night is collaborating with people who don't get it that's that's pretty brutal do you find that even at this point in your career that you're up against that still and because your your reputation precedes you so well sometimes i mean you might pitch a new TV show, and you know, oh, this would be great. If you let us do this, it would be great. And then you know, people, or maybe everyone turns it down, and you think, oh, well, they didn't, they didn't get this idea. So that happened to you a lot as a producer, right? Yeah. You got, uh, Pineapple Express was probably turned, it was hard, that was a hard sell, wasn't it, originally? Well, because it's a, a you know, now movie? it seems kind of soft. It, it, I don't, like, I don't mean, soft, I'm soft. But not as edgy as it was at the time. It's right. like, let's do a... You know, we thought it was like a combination of a Cheech and Chong movie and a Jerry Bruckheimer action movie. That's great. You know? Yes, and it was it was based on I was watching um, the the movie True Romance, and there's a scene where Brad Pitt is stoned out of his mind, and you know all the bad guys come in and they need information from him, and I just thought it was just such a funny thing seeing a stone guy deal with like hit men, and I thought right. I'd rather watch that movie. I would like to follow Brad Pitt now out of that room and see what the rest of his day is. And so that was the inspiration. And we wrote it, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg and I, uh, as because we couldn't get Superbad made. So no one would make Superbad. Maybe because? It seemed, maybe it seemed they... too edgy because it was about high school kids and it was kind of dirty. So we said, let's write something commercial. So we did Pineapple Express. That's and commercial. then no one wants to make that either. <laughs> and then suddenly Superbad went. And then when that went, the same studio, Sony, was like, Okay, maybe maybe you guys have some sense of what you're doing, but but even today, Av, is it is it hard to sell things for you? I think it's a weird environment generally in show business at this moment. 
I think that it's a little weird. I think that there's something about all these streamers that is a little tricky because they have all this data. And I think it makes them think they know what people want. Do they not? I don't think so. I think like a lot of the greatest things that have ever happened have been things that have slipped through. So for instance, like Seinfeld took like three years right. for people to start watching. Cheers took like at least like two years before it got its audience. But now they have this metadata and they know, you know, like the second anybody shuts it off. Well, most people watch it for seven and a half minutes and then they took a break for three days and they watch four minutes and they, they just have too much information. And I think it makes them think that they can predict what the audience would like when really the only way to do that is someone having an artistic soul and having a sense of, you know, what's really creative and, and interesting. Because if you watch streamers, everything leads to like child murder or dating shows or pets. Like it'll go lowest common denominator. Like the, I, you know, if you just follow what is a hit, everything would just be a serial killer. Right. So when you, when you end up on a streamer with the intention originally to be on, in, a, in, a, in a theater, like uh, The King of Staten Island, right? That was a movie. Yeah. Does, is that disappointing or is that? Well, that was a, a weird situation because we worked on the movie. We, we tested it in theaters. It played great. And then the pandemic hit. Right. And Universal said, do you want to just put it online and we'll just sell it? And then we'll put it you know, on HBO. And Pete Davidson was like, I just want people to see it. I mean, he was very cool. He was, because the question was, do you want to wait like two years to put it out or just get it to people? And I think we both thought, well, the movie is about firefighters and first responders and their families and the effects of that life and the sacrifices people make. And we just thought, it seems like this is the perfect time to put this out to people. Right. So we, we put it out. But it is a drag because it killed in the theater. Like people really yeah. liked it for the most part comedy should be seen it's like doing stand-up without an audience you know if you're if you're on a streamer you know uh, you want to hear other people laugh that that's kind of the contagion yes. of the enjoyment of it's like a concert you know a yeah. movie and so I, I was that's why i wanted to ask you that but that being said it was it was great and it was great for yeah. pete and it was great for you do you ever uh, stand back and think about how many careers and how many people you are, you have some hand in making them household names, like the amount of people that you have touched. And I don't, yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like touching, but you know, it's, it's pretty amazing how many people that you are involved in. Do you ever sit back and go, Oh my God, like we wouldn't know the Seth Rogan's, and the Jonah Hills, and maybe even the Pete Davidson was on SNL, and uh, Amy Schumer, you brought her to a whole new level. Everybody, you know, Lena Dunham, you know, and all these people who are kind of household names now, at least in the world of comedy, wouldn't be there if they hadn't met and worked and collaborated with you. Well, I think a lot of them would have found a different way to do it, but I, I'm just such a fan. So when I meet anybody who I think uh, is talented, I just think, oh, if they had a, a movie, I would go. Like that's really a simple. Like I, when I when I met Amy, I just thought, man, I wish there was an Amy movie. And then I think, oh, I'll try to help her accomplish that. So just as a fan, it's always as a fan first. You just meet someone and you think, oh, I, I'd love to see Lena Dunham's TV show. And that's kind of all it is, really. Because when I was a kid, like I would watch Saint Elsewhere. I loved you. I was a gigantic fan of yours, but I was very aware of you before St. Elsewhere. Oh my God, Howie Mandel is now on this show. This is kind of incredible. And and I would track different people. Oh, Michael Keaton is on Working Stiffs with Jim Belushi. Wow, you remember that. And I would know, oh, Andy Kaufman. I loved Andy Kaufman. He's gonna be on a TV show called Taxi next year. And I think that's how my head always worked. It was like the way sports nuts know someone's coming out of college or is getting uh, drafted out of high school. I was aware of the comedians moving up. So I think that's how my head works. Like, who's next? And But so you were also, oh, go ahead. It sounds like that you create movies for you that you want to see. You're not really focused on what the trends are, like you were saying with the streamers, how they know what's going to be big. But you, when you make a movie, it's something that you had in mind that you would want to see. 
Yes, I think that's and that's all it is. Is you know we had Scooter yeah. Braun here, uh, and and I asked him what he felt his success. What, what is his um, kind of? Um, he called it his chi of success. Yeah. Was the fact that when he made the the switch to kind of going after not what he thought would sell, but what he liked, and you just yeah. have to be lucky, I think, in what you like to have the world share that same taste, right? I Yeah, and for a long time it felt like they didn't. <laughs> you know, they like, didn't? Because like you were I, pretty young when you broke yeah. in. Yeah, I mean, I the people that I liked at the time were, were still, you know, the people we worked on the Ben Stiller show with Ben and Bob Odenkirk and Andy Dick and Janine, Janine Garofalo, but then the show didn't succeed, but everyone succeeded off of it. Right. And so, I, I mean, I think the key for me is just to, can I stay in touch with that feeling of you know who's really making me laugh, who seems different, and and mainly who has a story to tell. So when you meet somebody like Kamel Nanjiani and 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 Emily, and they tell you the story of how they met and their relationship, that's the greatness of it. The big sink. Yeah, both his talent, but also they have a very fascinating personal story to tell. Not everyone has a great story. Like some people are talented, but they don't have a great story they can't like jump into the screenwriting you're looking at me no <laughs> not at all i think you are no <laughs> great we just hired a new guy his name is kenny and kenny's going to be do producing all the commercials so this is kenny's first commercial uh remember always that was an amazing story that the big sick and that got uh, academy award nominations yeah they know? got they got yeah. nominated yeah that's fantastic. So you, but your first love was, are you a jazz musician or were well, you? Well, my grandfather was a jazz producer and he had his own label called Mainstream Records and he ran like the jazz label from Mercury Records, MRC Records. And he produced you know, the first Janis Joplin record. He produced Charlie Parker wow. and Dinah Washington and people like that. So when I was a kid, my parents, uh, I mean, my, my dad worked for my, for my grandfather at this label. And I think on some level I just thought, oh, he's a hustler. Like he hustled. He was just like a guy from the Bronx who loved jazz and he would raise his own money, hire the jazz musicians himself, record them, get the records printed, go to the store and sell them like 10 at a time. Really? And that's how he broke into the music business in the late 40s. And I think on some level, it must have seeped into my head like, oh, you got to be a hustler. You got to you have to invent yourself and invent your your career. So I didn't think it at the time. but I think on some level, there was a part of me that thought, oh, just you just got to be ballsy. But you and, and in following and, and, and doing some research that your career was always about being ballsy, whether it was in school and putting together comedy nights yeah. or uh, phoning and, and, and chasing people that you were fans of and interviewing them or yeah. you were do, without working for anybody ju just on your own. You yeah. are ballsy. I interviewed you. Yeah. Did you? Yes. As a kid. As a kid. When I was 16, I interviewed you over the phone. I, I somehow got you to talk to me in probably 1980. Four, and uh, and I'm sure I, I have the tape somewhere. Oh, really? Maybe I'll send it. I want to you. Please send it. it to me. I'm going to put it into this. You could slice it. But the worst part is I have this Long Island accent, so I'm like a kid. My voice hasn't really broken yet, so I'm like, so Howie, what's it like doing an hour television show? It's a little different than you stand up. Like, how does that for you? But we don't have to have it. That was he just recreated <laughs> that moment right now. I want to hear that. That's and, amazing. Yeah. Hello, is Mr. Mandel there? Yeah, speaking. Hi, this is Judd Apatow. I spoke to you uh, about a week ago about an interview. Oh, yeah, right, right. I just got your message. I just got back in town. I was in Vegas. I saw you on the telephone. Yeah, right. Pretty good. Jerry Lewis complimenting you? Yeah, that was nice. Um, do you think you can have any time before I'm leaving on Saturday morning? Oh, sure. Let's do it uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? Sure. Uh, let me get a... Oh, so you, then you, is later tonight better for you? No, I'm going over to the Ice House to interview the unknown comic, Murray Langston. Murray, yeah. Um, yeah. Tomorrow morning. Okay, where do you want to do it? Uh, How long is this going to take? Uh, about a half hour. 
I mean, if you want to cut it short, I can. Okay, we'll, we'll wait. So, 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 we'll see if so how about giving me a shout about 11.30? Okay. 11.30. Okay. Uh, so you want to do this over the phone or in person? Uh, you know something? Over the phone might be better because I can call you from wherever I am. Or you call me here, and the only reason I say over the phone is because even if I'm not home, I'll, we'll do it. Yeah. You know, and that way I can... Because I only get a couple days in between. I only got tomorrow off. It's my only day, and I have to go do some shit in the morning. Yeah. Uh, so, um, should I uh, give you a call? Are you going to call me? call me. At 11.30 tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, sure. That'll be great. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Rocket money. Rocket money. That was true, Bill, but now they're Rocket Money, and they're one of our sponsors on today's episode. You know what it is? I know what it is. It's a personal finance app. So they will find and cancel. They, it, will find and cancel unwanted subscriptions, monitors uh, your spending, lowers your bills all in one place, all on this app. How many times have you uh, subscribed to something like, porn and then you find that you didn't cancel it and you get charged every month it sees you're not using it and it it cancels it this is like an app that can be your personal accountant that's rocket money you're saying howie how do we get it you go to rocketmoney.com slash howie did you hear me rocketmoney.com slash howie You'll have all your subscriptions canceled that you're not using. It'll monitor your spending and it'll lower your monthly bill. One more time, rocketmoney.com slash Howie. You've no seen the picture. I have that picture with Howie. Yeah, we have a picture. From we'll Caroline's the, yes. in New York. Yes. Where I went uh, you know, to see you on a, on a date with a young woman. I was uh, trying to win back my girlfriend from seventh grade. In 11th grade, I tried to win her back took her to see you and it did not work Why? Is it, are you blaming because of you because, <laughs> because of me of him? she didn't like me i don't know on the way home she just kept talking about some other guy i'm like damn how he did not get this done for me i'm not a good wingman and people don't think of me as a closer really um i also am fascinated by the breadth of uh, you know a, a lot of people in our business and i say our business predominantly comedy have like a brand, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm torn up about this, but I used to be a big Woody Allen fan and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really- You're confused. I'm, I'm not confused. I know that I'm not a Woody Allen fan yes. anymore, <laughs> but that killed me. Yes. You know what I mean? And yeah. were you a Woody Allen fan? Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so, it's, a, it's a tough one to talk about because I think as, as kids, like I would have VHS tapes right when VHS was invented. Yeah. And so we only had like eight, tapes for years and it was like the movie 10 the blake edwards movie godfather you know serpico and all the woody allen movies that's yes. that's and we would just watch them over i'd watch woody allen so but but the point was that it, and i'm just using him as a there was a brand that was him and steve mm -hmm. martin i know you're a big steve martin, i was yes. a huge steve martin fan there was a brand and you uh, judd apatow movie in in the comedy always had i connected to not only was it funny but it was real and it had a heart there was always there's always a real human connection and it didn't seem like it was just silly for silly sake or funny for funny sake but it was it was grounded in heart but beyond that I was so bowled over i've talked to you about this about the gary shandling the documentaries mm -hmm. and things which they you would not know unless you do know that the same guy that wrote, you know, 40-year-old virgin, virgin is the same guy that put together what I believed, you know, was one of the best documentaries and inspirational documentaries I've seen in, in years. And I'm just fascinated by how the breadth of work that you are kind of attached to, they're not, you don't have a, do you have a brand? Do you have a, is there a Judd Apatow brand? Um, I mean, I mean, most of it is inspired by Gary. You know, Gary really thought that you try to go as deep as you can go in revealing who a person is. How how complex can you get? He was he always just wanted to get to the core of people, and off camera, and on camera. I mean, both. Like the the, the writing was about just this human experience, and so he was fascinated, obviously, by talk shows and people in show business and the ways our egos and our need to succeed prevents us from being close to people and loving people because 
we're in this game and in this race that we want to win and we only feel good if we're doing well. And he found all of that really uh, interesting and a great metaphor for, for life, like obstacles to love. And I think in everything I, I've done, I think about Gary and James Brooks and Cameron Crowe and Barry Levinson and Nicole Holof Center and people like that. And then when I do the documentaries, to me, I think it's just the same thing. If I'm making a documentary about Gary, I'm thinking, who's Gary? How, you know, what's the puzzle? Like what happened to him that turned him into Gary? And then what, what was the struggle? What was he trying to work out during his life? And so it becomes an investigation of his personality and his humanity. And luckily Gary was very open. So there was an enormous amount of material where he really spilled. It was much different with George Carlin because when he did interviews, he didn't tell the truth. He never even mentioned he had a family in most of his interviews. No. I mean, he really kept it close to the vest. He was almost like a DJ when he talked to people. Right. He wasn't open. Right. But he was working on an autobiography and there were 23 hours of tapes with him and Tony Hendra, his, his ghostwriter, and it was just them shooting the shit. He's probably high and just telling Tony everything. And it wasn't meant for anyone to hear. And so that became a lot of the narration. How did you get? How did you get that? How did you find out about it? And how did you? We had to ask it. Uh, Tony uh, Hendra's family uh, if if they had the tapes. And how did they, you know they, they the existed? Tapes. You never know. I mean, you assume they're out there. I mean, his his daughter Kelly Carlin thought that these tapes existed. That that's the the basis of what the book was uh, built on. And then it was, you know, does anyone know where things are? You know, every right. once in a while you go, do you still have that? And some people are like, oh yeah, I got it right here in my attic. And other people are like, I have no idea. And it's gone forever. Yeah, and he never talked about his family. You know, Brenda is very, uh, is a key figure in my, uh, his wife. Yes. Is a key figure in my career. She How cast so? me, she cast me in the Young Comedian special. My wow. Young Comedian special, which I think was the sixth annual, was the, the Smothers Brothers presented me, yeah. uh, Jerry Seinfeld, Richard Lewis, and Harry Anderson. We were wow. the kids at the Roxy. That's a Grand Slam home run show, right? Yes. They picked well. Yeah, they did. Brenda. That's incredible. Brenda, she knew comedy. So she was a booker for those shows. The Young Comedian specials. Incredible. You know, so she was, uh, that, that was pretty amazing. You have this, uh, I, I, this insatiable interest in humanity, even outside of writing stories and, and producing. I was also bowled over by you. Um, you did the movie Trainwreck with uh, Amy Schumer, and, and in Trainwreck, uh, Norman Lloyd, was, uh, who is, uh, I think I'm probably getting a spam call. I am. <laughs> My uh, warranty is overdue. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Norman Lloyd, who was on Saint Elsewhere, who was an actor in the Hitchcock movies. In um, what's the one? He was the the saboteur. Yeah, and he was the saboteur, wasn't he? Yes, yes. Uh, lived to be like 106 years old. He he was in his movie, and then after the movie, this is this is the human that we are sitting with right now. You stayed in touch with him, and you would bring him. You, to lunch and then call me or yeah. Ed Begley who knew him from uh, from St. Elsewhere. And he, you were just such a joy and such a, you became like family. And I, I know you do that with a lot of people. Well, Norman, I met through Ed O'Neill. So I would see Ed O'Neill all the time. We vacation in the same place. He's like, you got to meet this Norman guy. He's my neighbor. He's incredible. He's like from another time. He's like, he's been sent you know through a time machine here and he's was friends with charlie chaplin and yeah. you know worked with buster keaton and so we hung out with him a couple of times and then we were going to make train wreck and part of train wreck was that her dad is in a nursing home because he has ms and i thought oh maybe norman could be one of the people in the nursing home and at the time he was 99. <laughs> so you think you know can he do it can you get him from la to new york like how does that work so I asked him to do it. There's no lines, it's all Im improv. Yeah. So he's like, where is it? I'm like, no, we're just gonna, we'll make it up. And so he's flying there. And then I'm like, did Norman get here? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, did someone like come with him? He's like, no, he just flew alone <laughs> to New York. And they just picked him up and dropped him at the hotel. 
So I call him at the hotel the next day. I'm like, Norman, how'd that, how'd that, that trip go? He's like, it went great, but it took me an hour and a half to figure out how to shut the lights in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> but at 99, he was still playing tennis. Yes, he yes. was. He, he stopped until, at that year. That yeah. year he stopped. He told me that he had fallen he had fallen down at, on the tennis court while playing tennis, and he went to a doctor because he wanted to see what was wrong, why he fell mm -hmm. playing tennis, and he was diagnosed. The doctor went, you're fucking 99. <laughs> <laughs> Stop playing tennis. That's yeah. why. He would play doubles, and he, and he was like Charlie Chaplin's main tennis partner right. for a, a really long time. And so we would take him to lunch, and he would just tell us all the stories and he was just so funny and, and had a spirit. I can only compare it to Martin Short in the sense of somebody who's really like lit up, like positive, optimistic, really funny, really sharp and cutting all the time. I mean, he never, I never even saw him depressed except once we were at dinner and he was you know, like 104. Right. And he was telling some story about someone and he just goes, yeah, he's dead. They're all dead. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Everyone's dead. And I'm like, but uh -huh. you've replenished, Norman. I'm here. You have a new, a new set of friends. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but he was so sweet. He's like, I've worked with all the greats. Hitchcock, Kubrick, Apatow. <laughs> <laughs> working with people you work with family a lot yes yes is that is Does that, that suck <laughs> it's hard for you i understand <laughs> i can see the pain at the table right now i mean what's better than that right it's just i, I think it's thing. amazing but i would imagine you know this is me and my daughter doing a a podcast which is i would imagine when you are on the set of a multi tens of million dollar budget film uh, there's got to be like pressure that has nothing to do with anybody else yes. in the film. That and and as the director and the writer and the producer, um, people outside the business don't realize the weight that you carry. You yeah. have to be there for every aspect, even mm -hmm. somebody's hair. Yes, <laughs> you know, especially somebody's hair. So then, and then the, your leading lady a lot of time is your own wife. Mm -hmm. Is that is that tough to navigate, or because um, you got to have like a rough day, but then you go home. With the well, person. you know, it's it's that's not we never have like a rough day and go home and it's hard, you know. It, it's it's more that we know each other really well, and so there's a shorthand on all the ideas and the comedy. And you know, when we do movies together, we've you know we're collaborating, uh, you know, on the on the writing, on the invention of it. So it, it's all organic. You know, we've talked about these ideas and these moments and how they might play. And I, I find it really, really fun. And I think, especially even re repeating work with people you've done it with before is always great because you just know each other. You just get something. It's hard to even know. Like if you do something with Paul Rudd, you just kind of know some stuff about him that maybe another person wouldn't know how to bring it out. Do you see these people outside of work? Is uh, Paul, Paul a good friend? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I love Paul. I mean, he's in New York. So, uh, you know, I, I don't see him as much as, uh, as I wish I could, but, uh, you know, I, I like everybody. I mean, part of it for me is I think on some level, as I get older, I realize that maybe my dream was to build community more than anything. Is that, there anyone that you've worked with that you decide you don't want to work with again? Catherine Heigl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, right. Uh, well, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I want to work, you know, with people who are like enjoying it. And that, you know, the process feels... Catherine Heigl kind of, from my yeah. outside view, for those that don't know, um, uh, the, the movie was... Uh, uh, knocked Up. Knocked Up. And to me, that was, for her, the breakout, you know, for her from television. Do you know about this story? And I then, know I know the movie and I know her and I loved her in it. You don't remember? She badmouthed it. I don't remember that. She badmouthed it. And I thought that you were kind of taken aback. Like, even if what she was saying was real in her mind, and I was surprised that she said it. How did you, how did you cope with that? Like, who? Well, I think that we all feel like we're in the foxhole together. So if someone at the end of it feels like, oh, I don't like how that came out, it certainly hurts your feelings because it's, it's a large collaboration for a long time. 
Right. And so that was definitely surprising. And mainly surprising because I think she crushed it. And we had so much fun. Right. And so it was just- So you was, had no it sense- It was fun while you were filming? Like yeah. everything was great? Everything was great, yeah. So you had no sense that this was an issue for her? Yeah, I didn't. I really didn't ha have a sense of it. And so- uh, so, but that, I mean, I get it, like looking back, you know, now, I mean, you could look at everything differently. We certainly were trying to show combative relationships. And I think we were coming out of a period in comedy where a lot of the parts for women were perfect people. And sometimes they were there just to kind of get a guy from A to B or other times they were just a goal for a man. Right. And our idea was, let's just show relationships the great parts and also the really hard parts where you go you know rough against each other you know where it gets ugly and it's hard to get along and right and here's all the levels of it we'll try to be as truthful as we can about what's tough right from your point of view from, from a point man's of point of view yeah but also there's a lot of improvisation there's a lot of collaboration about what that is but i think at the end of it uh you know she thought that it, it wasn't exactly what she wanted it to be. And was she surprised by the cut? Was it when she saw the cut, it was different than what she expected? Well, it's hard because we improv so much. So you can't right. say, this isn't like the script because like the script goes out the window. Does it always days. go out the window for you? Uh, what percentage of what you uh, bring to the set is actually, because I, you know, you said you were a fan of St. Elsewhere. On St. Elsewhere, they were, you know, I, I couldn't say, and if the word was the, the preposition, yes. like that, like they were so, and I'm not knocking them, that's yeah. everybody has their. Yeah, if you write well, you don't need to improv like me. <laughs> you write well. <laughs> no, but that's not the point. The point is that that you do write well and you tell an amazing story, but is. Is it depending on the people in the cast? Like whether or not they feel more comfortable to improv or is that just your, it's the same. Uh, yeah, I need people who can do it because I feel like. Sometimes someone just reveals something of their essence when it's looser. Now, I really, you know, I, I, I couldn't respect the people who don't change it more. I mean, you know, whatever, Bruce Paltrow and, right. and the Coen brothers, like people were, you know, Noah Baumbach, you know, and I had friends that were like, oh, I just did a movie with Noah Baumbach. And the best part was I didn't have to improv. You know, they love the, how... Well, I heard how exacting it is. But for me, and I think some of it is from working with Gary and working with Ben Stiller, we just noticed that when you loosened it up, sometimes something kind of magical that you couldn't have even anticipated would happen. And, and it's a little more of a, I guess, like a Robert Altman approach to it. And I just, I, I think as a director, I just get excited to see other people beat it more than I'm proud of my joke working. I heard Jonah Hill talking on a thing when he worked with the Coen brothers and they kept, he, he had to take after take and then they went over and they go the words and he goes, you're not, I don't think you're using my skill. This is not, you hired me. Have you heard him talk about that? No, no. You know, but I think because he kind of grew up in your world yes, and then goes to, it's a, that's a tough transition to go from yeah. where you're allowed to do that. Well, some to, people love it. I mean, I definitely remember like talking to I think it was Ben Stiller about working with Noah Baumbach, and he loved it. Really? He was just so happy. And I remember Jeffrey Tambor at Larry Sanders. He never wanted anyone to rewrite the script because he loved trying to figure out how to make the language work. You know, what is the rhythm of this? What can I do to make this work? Uh, and it's, it is just a different uh, approach to it. And, I, you know, sometimes I just think I, sh I should work harder on locking in the <laughs> in these scenes but there's just been so many moments where like i know the best joke in the movie was something seth rogan just said you know right. like Catherine heigl's like i'm pregnant and seth goes fuck off and <laughs> i didn't write that you didn't write fuck <laughs> you know, off. <laughs> and i never would have thought the response to i'm pregnant would be fuck off uh and it's all in his performance and his energy and and there's just hundreds of where movies. did you find seth he was a kid. He was a stand-up from Vancouver. Where did you find him? Uh, we had a you know a casting director, uh, Allison Jones, and she just sent us uh, a tape of like forty people from Vancouver uh, auditioning 
to play kids on Freaks, Freaks and, and Geeks. Geeks yeah. and, and the idea that Paul Feig and I had was we'll have Paul rewrite the script based on who we find. It doesn't have to be exactly the characters Paul wrote. There'll be some adjustment for tapping into the, the natural, uh, you know, make it more style real style of somebody. So we were really open to anybody and non actors. So we just looked at the tape, and I just was, I just, I can remember the moment watching it, just in the in, at my house, just popping in a VHS and just going like, that guy seems funny. I mean, it's not even more complicated than that. Like, oh, I love a guy like that. Was he doing stand up or was he reading? He was reading, and we we wrote a uh, generic audition scene. And it was all about like a kid talking about growing pot underground and that he had this dream of growing all this pot underground. So if the <laughs> cops ever came, you could blow the entrance and they wouldn't ever discover your underground pot layer. Not too far from who he is, right? Well, now he is. He is <laughs> now he's a, a, a mogul there. But um, and he was just really funny reading it. And then we brought him to town to to meet him and. When we, when we tried to get the cast approved, everybody read for like the head of the network. And Seth, we just had a tape. Right. And we're like, and we like this guy to kind of pop in every once in a while. And they were like, okay, why? Well, fine. Like they didn't even like think much about it. And then as we were shooting the show, slowly we realized that this guy that we thought was just, would be like the button joke here and Riffling. there, like a funny, edgy guy who would pop in with a joke. We realized, oh, there's a really kind of beautiful spirit here and he's much deeper and more complex than we thought and slowly the writing adjusted based on what we were learning about Seth as a person. So that's what, I, going back kind of full circle to where we started, when you see a tape of some unknown kid from Vancouver who today is like a mogul in yeah. our business, mm -hmm. doesn't that, and, and because you said okay or because your eyes laid on it, I, I, that's, I find that fascinating. You're like a, a genie, <laughs> a comedy genie. <laughs> well, it's genius. kind of a miracle that someone is a hundred times more talented than you even assumed. And, you know, we would do, every once in a while, if we couldn't figure out a scene, we would have people improvise. And so we, we d did a scene with Seth uh, and we just went, wow, his improvs are really good. And we realized like, oh, he's an fuck amazing off. writer. <laughs> yeah. Fuck off. He wrote, he but, wrote fuck off. But it's also because you give that, you've given him that opportunity or people that opportunity. I would imagine a lot of people in the industry is like looking for someone that already has a resume or is already yes. acting and not just some guy that could be funny and you give him a chance. Yeah, and that's probably the danger of like what's happening in show business now is Show business should always be about breaking the next person. And mm -hmm. I think it's a little more about what's the IP that everyone likes already? What's the safety? What's the, they're yeah. spending a lot of money. They're, it's just safe. The yeah. analytics, that's how the streamers yeah. are working. What is next for you? What are you looking at? What excites you? Okay, I'm doing a commercial now. You know what I'm doing it for? For Raycons, I love Raycons because I listen to podcasts. I actually listen to myself. I'm a huge fan of mine. And I listen to music and I work out. And all their products are, you know, they seem to be less expensive than other products. And for, I'm telling you, the quality is just as good, if not better. And they have so many options. You know, whether you want speakers, whether you want ear earbuds, Raycon is the place. And uh, I don't know anybody that doesn't listen to things. And you can get, you can get it customized and they have, uh, they have different finance options. It's just a really good company and I'm glad that they're helping support my podcast. So thank you, Raycon. How do you get Raycons? You're ready to buy small and uh, you can buy something small that makes a big impact because it does. It changes your life whatever you're listening to. Ready to buy small with a big impact? Go to buyraycon.com slash how he does stuff to score 15% off. Did you hear what I'm saying? How do you get 15% off? You go to buyraycon.com slash how he does stuff. It's so simple. Back to the show. Great, we just hired a new guy. His name is Kenny and Kenny's gonna be do producing all the commercials. So this is, the merch just keeps growing. You can get a nice shirt with glasses. We have these things. Go to HowieMandel.com. We'll stay right here, keep listening. And when you're finished, go to HowieMandel.com and dress like me. Back to the show. Great, we just hired a new guy. What is next for you? What are you looking at? What excites you? 
Um, well, I produced a movie with the, the three guys from Saturday Night Live. Uh, they're called Please Don't Destroy, who make the short yeah, videos. I love them. And so we shot that last summer. Right. Uh, and that'll come out this coming summer. When you say we, we shot it, did you direct it? I didn't direct it. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but it's really, really funny. Paul Burgante directed it, who did all their shorts the last couple of years. Is it hard for you as a producer to kind of hand it over and allow somebody, because uh, uh, directing, uh, directing and writing is the ultimate in control. Mm -hmm. And producing is kind of like one step before the, uh, the executives, mm -hmm. where you just hand it over. Yeah. Uh, is that hard for you to watch it? And Well, it's, it is definitely a different skill because you're working with people, giving them notes, like you become the studio. So right. you're, you're giving them notes, you're kicking it around with them, you're trying to kick the tires on it, help them figure out who should be in it, how much money do we need to do it. I mean, there's a business side of it, that's a, a big part of it. And I always look at it like, I'm just looking at a boat and if there's a hole somewhere, I'm trying to help them fill it. Like, I just go to where the trouble is. And sometimes there isn't much trouble. You know, when we did Superbad, Greg Matola just crushed it as the director and the first time we screened it it murdered and like there was like very little to do and that's your dream situation that by the time you get there the script and the and the director and the cast everything's just gelled and you know i i like to think sometimes like on some of these projects i'm like the anti aaron sorkin like i want to do nothing <laughs> like that's my, and sometimes i have to do a ton and sometimes a little like it's different every project but my goal is to do nothing. I love that goal. <laughs> I, did you watch, did you see this Spielberg documentary on yes, HBO? Yes, I did. And what fascinated me there, it was great, and, and I recommend it, but what fascinated me is they were all these young Turks, you know, that, that would, uh, breaking into Hollywood when he did his first movie, and it was George Lucas and Scorsese, and, uh, and, and there was this group of young directors that all collaborated. Like, I yeah. didn't know that, you know, Spielberg shot in, in Scarface, he shot the, the shoot up yes. scene in the, yeah. do, do you share your work with other um, people who have absolutely nothing to do with that film just because you have a friend and have them help you? Oh, or, sure. Uh, yes? Yeah, I, I beg anybody to read it, watch the cuts, go to the previews. I'll just, I'll pull anybody in that I respect to to tell me what they make of it. And and it's really fun too. I mean, so we've done you know screenings for friends. You know, I remember one of the movies, you know, Ron Howard came to. Maybe I think maybe it was funny people. And then he just gave me his notes like, you know, wow, these are the Ron Howard notes of what he would do to fix this and take it to the next level. And and that's really fun. And some people, you know, Gary Shandling was always the the go-to person for me on, on those notes. And you wrote for him, you started with Gary by writing, did you write the Grammys? Did you write? I wrote the, the Grammys with him. The stand-up, yeah. uh, his monologue. Yes, the, the, I don't know if it was like 1990. When, it, when was the first Gulf War? That was the year. I don't know. It, it had it's just a, started. I was in shock and awe, I don't remember it. <laughs> exactly. Um, you stand up. That's, uh, yeah. you're going back to stand, I mean, originally I knew you as a stand-up. Mm -hmm. You lived with uh, the, Adam Sandler. That's and, right. And you guys were doing stand-up together, right? Yeah. I just opened up for Adam for a week in Florida on the road. And that was amazing to just see just how great he is. I mean, he really has an incredible act and he's selling out like 10,000 seaters. The venues were 10,000 seats? And I saw he's here too and... California, I think this week. Yeah, he's been yeah. doing shows. He was in Vegas, but it was just fun for me because I just remember sitting around our like shitty apartment in North Hollywood trying to get good spots from Bud Friedman. That it turned into this. Like after thirty-five years, you know, he's as creative as ever. The crowd loves him. They have this long relationship, friendship with him from all the stuff he's put out to make people laugh, and so it was really fun to to share that with him. And do you have that same love? Of, did you, when he tried out for Saturday Night Live, were you trying, were you already directing? You were writing. No I, no, I was doing nothing at that time. I couldn't even get an audition. I was not in the same place as Adam. Adam had just done Letterman, which was a big deal. Right. And uh, yeah, he got on Letterman really young and was great. And then he auditioned for Lauren in Chicago. He didn't do like characters, he just did stand up. And they brought him on as a, 
writer performer and so suddenly i'm like in my apartment alone you know that, like it's the ultimate sign that your career is not going great like your, your roommate has left you're in the apartment alone he's still paying rent for like five six months like maybe he'll get fired like he doesn't know so he keeps the apartment right and i'm just like lonely in it <laughs> <laughs> not doing well and and <laughs> did you ever want to give up were you ever did you ever or you just no i never thought about giving up i just thought God damn, some of these people I'm friends with are really crazy funny. Like I had an awareness of just how good Jim Carrey was or, right. you know, I mean, David Spade lived down the street, Schneider, Rob Schneider lived across the street. There were just a lot of people really peaking in how funny they were. And I don't know if that was just a, like a special moment also in the comedy scene that like late 80s, early 90s where there were just a lot of people. But that's before Jim Carrey stuff. blew up. Yeah, it was you right wrote, before he blew up. And I, I remember because I started out at the same club as him in Toronto. And and he was like standing ovations every night. But he was yeah. doing like kind of a Danny Gans kind of thing where he was yeah. doing impressions, yeah. singing impressions of Sammy a, Davis Jr. And Yeah, he was doing, uh, you know, on Golden Pond routines. Right. But then he, he, for whatever reason, he just made a decision, threw that all by the wayside and got very like kind of esoteric and yeah. weird. Were you friends with him at that time? Yeah, he, he said, he's like, he didn't want to be Rich Little. Right. I mean, he loved Rich Little, he's a Canadian legend. Yes. But he, I think he thought there was something inside him that he wanted to figure, figure out. Like, what do I think? I mean, because his act was impressions and it was a weird impressionist act. I mean, he would just like make his face look like James <laughs> Dean or right. Bruce Dern. I mean, it wasn't a, it, it wasn't like Danny Gans because it, it was still really, wonderfully strange but he decided i'm gonna drop all the impressions and just improvise an act and so i would watch him every night and he would get on stage with nothing nothing and improvise and just minute by minute he built this incredible really weird set and a lot of the things he did in that set became ace ventura became the mask he he, he figured out who he was on stage and you were there for all of it um so but now you're back to stand up you're getting a phone call Really? I'm yeah, it might be is. important. Uh, I don't want to say who it is, but it says spam risk. You don't want to take it? <laughs> it's that's a your spam wife. risk from England. So I'm being spammed from, from all around overseas, the world. Overseas, that's when you know you've made it. When you are getting spam calls from Europe. A Nigerian prince is calling me. But now that. you're doing stand-up on a regular basis. What yes. kind of stand-up? Do you um, like to improvise? or is all? Well, obviously, probably because all of your... Uh, movies and stuff mm -hmm. you say is improvising. Do you improvise or is most of your stuff written and planned out? Well, I have a terrible memory, so I'm forced into improvisation based on the fact that I can't get it down in my head. You'd bring notes? Uh, yeah, I usually put them on a chair and don't look at them, but I kind of <laughs> need them there out of my own terror. But I'm, yeah, I'm not one of those people who could just like work out the whole thing on stage, like some yeah. people write on but stage. But you did a special, you, but, did, you had worked out. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I mean, I, I sit and write it, and I, I, I work on it, uh, but I'm, I'm not like the improv guy. Although I did go to Largo a month or two ago, and I thought I was going to do stand up, but there was an improv show Brent, Ben Schwartz was putting on, and I had never done improv my entire life, and they go, "Yeah, you can't do stand up tonight. It's just an improv show," and he, and but do you want to do improv with us? Like they're going to go on. You're not allowed to say no. <laughs> exactly, and so I, I said yes and did improv for an hour. And it was, it, 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 I thought it went okay, but I had been avoiding that for 35 years. Like it was just a fear of that. And so it was a good thing to get over. But you didn't go back. You didn't do it I'll again. I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I always think it's so interesting to hear comedians, because I listen to Jerry Seinfeld too, who talks about how he writes like every single, every single yes. thing is so planned for him and it's not improv at all, right? right. Whereas some people have their whole act and most of it, is improv. Yeah. You do a lot of improv. That's laziness. Yeah, yeah I do yeah. a lot of laziness. No, you're, you're loose. I mean, I've been working on this uh, like documentary about Bob Newhart and Don Rickles and their friendship. And to, uh, uh, Bob Newhart was saying that Don Rickles really had nothing planned. Like he had like a bunch of jokes in his head, but every day he would just go out on stage and he, he it almost felt like he has like ADD or something where he can't organize it. It has to be scattershot crazy. And then he said he would sometimes improvise something incredible. He wouldn't remember he said it when the show ended, and he would never like write it down and say it again. 
That's terrible. That always bothers me. Yeah. I do like to improvise, but if I say something, I usually have somebody with me or I'll, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll turn to them and go, write that down, write that down. Yeah. No, or you or, say it in your phone and then you wake up the next morning and none of it makes sense. You should yes. see his notes on his phone. None of it makes sense. Yeah, I don't, you don't understand know. what I've done. And I don't get high, so yeah. I don't even understand what I've done. How often are you going out doing stand-up now? Not much now. But I was, you know, up until COVID doing 200 nights a year. Wow, that's and, crazy. Yeah, but now I see you. I follow you on, on Instagram and you're at you're a regular at Cafe Largo and, it, yeah. and you do uh, uh, um, Judd Apatow and Friends. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 you host like a night of music and comedy. I see like yes. big iconic uh, music people. Yes, along. We, we, uh, we, I, and they're all benefits. So it's like once or twice a month. Right. And it's always a benefit for something, which I like because then you could ask anyone to do it. You know, like it's not a money making endeavor. So you could, you know, we had Randy Newman came down one night and wow. Beck has done a whole bunch of them. And, uh, you know, so that it's, it's so to me, it's just an excuse to have a great fun night and we pick a cause and do it. You, you have to come down. Invite me and I'll be yes, there. Yes, please. Yes, I'd love to. We also do a benefit for the children's uh, Teen Cancer USA. Yeah, yeah, UCLA every year. You host uh, that backyard show, which yes. is pretty amazing. With yeah, the Who and yeah, the Who puts it on. Roger Daltrey. Yeah, and this year, it was John Fogerty and Green Day and Billy Idol and the Who. Yeah, in somebody's backyard. In somebody's backyard. And while the Who is playing, <laughs> next door is Adam Sandler putting on a birthday party <laughs> for his daughter yes. and playing music, which they're asking him to turn down because it's yes. disturbing the Who. <laughs> But exactly. I'll never forget. I always, I, 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 he hosts it and does a wonderful job. And I, I'll show up and do the, um, um, the auction. The wow. auction. And you end up buying so much stuff. <laughs> I always buy something because there's always something I'm, I'm just embarrassed that's not selling. I feel like that's half of those celebrity auctions is the people involved feel so bad that something isn't selling. And the people are there too, it. right? Like the people Sometimes. who are selling themselves or a day with them or a lunch with yeah, them. Yeah, Hans Zimmer was there. It was yeah. hard to get. Hans Zimmer was there and he wanted to, he was going to give you dinner at his place, wherever yeah. he lives, yes. and go to see a live concert at uh, someplace in the UK. Yeah. It's probably, you know, and it's, you know, do I hear $200? <laughs> you know, but I think it was more than that. No, they but, sold it for a lot ultimately, but it is it is scary. I was remember we did one and was Paul Stanley from Kiss on stage with yeah, us. Yeah. And and it's I think that's uncomfortable. You don't want the person there. Although I do remember going to a benefit once and Bruce Springsteen was there and they were auctioning off uh you know, go to a concert and meet Bruce. And they sold, you know, whatever it's selling for. It's a lot. And then Bruce goes, what if I throw in, I'll give you a guitar lesson. And then it just goes up astronomically. He goes, what if you get to eat lasagna with me and my mom? <laughs> 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 and then it's like a hundred and fifty thousand know, dollars. So. Well, the first the first year I did it, the who uh, Pete Townsend had no idea who I was. He didn't recognize me, and he was sitting in the back. And I, I I'll never forget. I came. They they had the, the the every year they do the same thing. They have that guitar yes. signed by all the who and any artist that is on that night. And yes. plus, mm -hmm. it's an amazing thing. And these are like hundred and fifty. They usually go for a hundred and fifty thousand. You know, because it's a collector's item. And he was sitting in the house. And I went back. He didn't know who I was, so I thought it would be funny to, he didn't like me. I, I went and he said, <laughs> are you Mr. Townsend? And he goes, yes, yes. I go, you guys must really, I'm not a, a music person, so I don't know. But I, your guitar just, we got almost, I think, close to $200 for it. He goes, pardon me? <laughs> go, we, got, we got close to $200 for your guitar. And I don't, like, I don't even know who you are, yet people were willing to pay hundred, almost hundreds of dollars for it. He goes, American, are you talking about American dollars? I go, yeah. I go, I, you know, we started at 50 bucks and went to 75 and 100 and I could have kept going, but you know, we have to get the show going, but I got close to $200 for it. And he just looked so dejected and I walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and that was you spend the night annoying people there because I think you also have a video of someone rehearsing to go on and you trying to join the circle <laughs> to rehearse with them oh, to with sing. Ro Roger Daltrey this yeah. year, Eddie yeah. Vedder uh, sang with the Who. Yes, yes. So it was Eddie Vedder, Roger Daltrey going over there. He was going to sing with the Who, 
and I I saw them practicing. They were singing a song in the back. I have a video of me. We should post yeah. it. <laughs> they're just, uh, I'm going, no, 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 different key. And they're both looking at me like, I think Eddie thinks I'm with Roger. Roger <laughs> thinks I'm with Eddie. Like, why am I singing? And just, I, my favorite thing. And, and they yeah. close them out of the circle. Yeah, they just <laughs> turn their backs on me. I want to bring you all to my level. <laughs> <laughs> Great, we just hired a new guy. His name is Ken. You I love know my, You know my favorite prank of yours. I've told no. you about it before. Which one? It's you working at the buffet in Vegas, and then when people take like a lot of food, you take it back off their plate and say they took too much. Right. And people lose their shit. It is, it, 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 you did it for Regis. It is one of the funniest, simplest joke conceits. And, and it you, just works and you, every single time. It does. And you know why it works? Because it's the same reason that I'm a huge fan of yours. Yeah. My favorite, I'm not, you know, I do stand up, but I don't like jokes. I don't really like when somebody says, you wanna hear something funny? It's probably yeah. not funny and you, you've created, your movies and your scripts and everything you've done is so based in reality and people's funny um, kind of reactions. Yeah. It's very reactionary, your comedy. Like something happens and then I watch, you know, that's what sitcoms have lost. You know, it's yeah. a sitcom is short for situation comedy. The, the situations aren't funny. It's just people talking like Borscht Belt comics. Yeah, yeah. And that's not how people, a seven-year-old doesn't have a punchline for every fucking thing you say. And it doesn't ring true. And I can't, I can't lose myself yeah. in it. Your movies and whatever you do is so steeped in reality and humanity. And my entree into comedy, personally, this is you're the guest, but I'll just tell you, was Alan Funt. I love, oh, Ca sure. I love Candid Camera. And what I loved about it, you relate to it. It's engaging. You know, I'd say, what if I was in that situation? Mm -hmm. Would I believe that? Or oh, wouldn't yeah. that scare the shit out of me? So that's why I like doing it. it nowadays, people think pranks are mean, but I, I find them oh, funny. What, what was the one that you did? It was like, you were a parking valet, and so it was all about would people give their keys to you yeah. to take their car after you pull up screeching? No, I had a. I we rented it was for that was for Leno. We rented a like a, a shitty car. Yeah, and it was there two <laughs> shitty cars. And when we saw somebody coming up, I would back the car, smash the other car. I would smash in and keep moving it, and then I'd come out and ask for their car. <laughs> and, and people, it was just funny to watch people's reaction. But I always love people's reaction, and I think that's the same thing that you you talk about when you're asking somebody to improv. If yes. Catherine Heigl goes, I'm pregnant, yeah. and out of nowhere, the first time she hears, fuck off, mm -hmm. you're probably gonna get a real legitimate yes. reaction that you wouldn't have got had she learned the line, and yes. she, was, she wasn't expecting it. Well, and it's both people, you know, so her reaction is funny off of the fact that she doesn't know what he's gonna say. Right. And so the rule on the set usually is, um, Anyone can break off the script whenever they want. And what that does is it makes both actors, uh, they have to be on the edge of their, their seat because they can't just run it. Like they have to really listen. Well, that's the yeah. key. So acting is reacting. Acting mm -hmm. is not, when somebody, when you could tell when somebody is just reciting lines that they memorized and they didn't, um, well, you can't always tell, but that they memorized and they're just spewing their line and waiting for their cue. Yes. As opposed to two people having a conversation and the reason that we're having this conversation is you're listening to what I said and you will react to that. And the best way to get that is they're really doing it. They're really. Yes. And, and, and that's what's really fun because I, when I watched some of those scenes, what I like is the way people listen. Like you could see they're nervous because they don't know what's coming. And that's what life is like. Right. You know, they, there's just a look in your eyes like what's what's coming at me next. Uh, I, I want you to just keep doing what you're doing. I love you, buddy. I love what you do. I love that you're a good human being and I, all the work that you do outside of uh show business and uh, so many people are helped but in within show business you create these bonds with people that uh, from afar are just so um you know I, I would imagine that i don't know your kids but you, you've really set a good example they must end up uh, hopefully end up being wonderful people too because they watched how you guys kind of not things you told them but just yeah well they are mainly because of leslie but they are
They're, they're good, good girls. And they're both uh, continuing to pursue, and they're very good at acting. Are they both? Uh, yeah. Kind of- uh, Iris is, it was in The Bubble, the movie we did for Netflix this right, year. Right. And uh, Maude is on that show, Euphoria. Right. So they're, they're working. And uh, you, uh, do you critique, or do you just? Do I critique? You know what's so funny is uh, Maude was auditioning for this movie, and a lot of times you have to tape yourself, like the audition, like they call it a self-tape. Right. And they give you the scene, and and so th- in the movie, she's doing the scene with Matthew McConaughey, and I, so I'm reading with her, but I'm off camera, and right. this is for her to show off her acting skill. Right. But instead, I'm doing this like really obnoxious Matthew McConaughey impression. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hey there, little darling. And she's just, and, you know, I'm holding the camera also, so my voice is louder than hers because it's next to the microphone. So I, I tend to ruin everything with them. So usually they don't, they don't need me. Oh, they don't need me. I mean, on my movies, they need me. But whatever they're doing without me, it's best for me to not chime in because I'll turn everything into some goofy way I would do it. And did you did, do you, did you have any kind of um, uh, were you did any concern about so young being in the? It's a scary world. It's a tough world for yes. anybody who's fully formed. Uh, yeah. But you know, just the rejection or the I think the world now is mean on social media and that. Did you, did, I probably didn't of, think about it enough. Is the truth. But you know, we don't talk about anything but creativity in the house. So it's not like I talked about the international courts all the time and they're like, maybe I'll study international law. I mean, there's nothing but the talk of storytelling and jokes and creativity. So sometimes I wonder like, did I box them in due to my lack of interest in anything else? But you know, I worked with them when they were really little mainly because I just didn't want to meet other people's kids. <laughs> and so I was always you know, happy to have my kids there, and then I wouldn't have to deal with the parents of some other weird kid. Right. And, uh, but they did it like every couple of years their whole lives, and I think they got really comfortable, and they developed their own passion for it. So hopefully it, you know, they'll have a, a nice career. But every career in show business is really up and really down. And so part of what you're trying to teach somebody is you're in for a ride. This isn't like a normal job where you go to the office. Do you feel every like day. you've had a down? Well, since you since you really got your first hit movie, I guess just in your. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I, I've worked hard, and there've been successes and failures, and you know, there's an emotional cost to putting your heart out there. And every once in a while, when it doesn't connect, uh, you know, you feel it pretty deeply. But that, I guess, that's not like a real world problem compared to. Like are you, uh, if you like what you've done, are you that concerned with uh, box office or ratings or? I mean, I think it changes. And also you, you trick yourself into thinking you don't care. So you'll be like, you know, as long as I like it, as long as I'm proud, but then like somewhere deep inside of you died because <laughs> you, you really are trying to connect with people in a, in a big way. Is this the best podcast you've ever been part of? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I did Gilbert Gottfried's podcast. Mm, I did, and they too. just they just uh, ran it. They just ran it again the other day. I know. I just uh, they I just posted it for Dara. Yeah. You know, I got. Uh, we were talking right before Dara, his wife, sent me his uh, his set list. I'm a huge Gilbert fan. Continue. Oh, the funniest. I mean, the funniest human being. And I love funny, and I love to laugh. You always make me smile. You always make me laugh, and uh, you're a good guy. Thank you. I can't thank you enough for being here. And um, my, my pleasure. Thanks for it, letting me talk to you when I was 16. <laughs> what if you were an asshole to me? And then I just said, you know what? This business is not for me. Was he nice? I, so nice. I have the tape of it. I have your niceness. <laughs> I have proof of your kindness on tape. So this was the uh, reciprocal that, that because you interviewed me and I asked you to come on my yes. podcast. This is the same. <laughs> this is payback for 1984. Is that when it was? Wow. I cannot wait to hear this. Is that anyway, 38 years ago? I yeah. I think it is. That's when I was born. That's how long it took me to reciprocate. She's, she's 38. Yeah. Anyway. You probably were getting yelled at on the tape. Maybe, uh, Be quiet in there. No, I was baby. born in 80. Well. You were noisy when you were born. Was I? Well, her mother was colicky. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> we couldn't sleep. I had to, so she was. 
The podcast is kind of over. <laughs> Let's just babble it out for a while. That's what's no, happening. No, thank here. you very much. It's uh, it's a pleasure, and thank you for everything. And uh, honestly, for being kind to me as a young person, because that is what gave me the reserves to think I could do this, and also to think I love the people in the business. Right. You know, so like meeting people like you made me go, oh, there's there's something loving and warm there that's worth working to get to. So I can say that Judd Apatow thanks me and find and I am responsible for all your success. Yes, most most of it. Most and of it. without me you wouldn't be who you are today. What percentage? 70. 70. 70%. I thought it was going to be higher. There's there's 30 that didn't go right. I'm sorry. I, I always have it. I'm not. You're a writer and a producer. How do we? How do we? End, like, how do you end? Yeah. I don't know. You. This is on video, also. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't. You just do something with my head behind you. You do. You end on a on a visual. I don't know. You just do something with my. You want to just zoom in head. on that? You want to zoom in on the head? Jeremy will figure yeah. it out. Are you zooming in? Are they zooming in on the head? No. 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 You're getting direction from a, <laughs> an amazing director, and you're not listening. I think Kyle's just waiting with his finger on the button. The, the head's <laughs> too big for the shirt. It's just too big for the shirt. Will you direct the end of this podcast? Uh, I just think you would put your face up against, like you'd stand up and you would just like hold hold my face against your face, and then that would be the sweet end. You know, just like an intimate cheek, moment, cheek, like cheek. like what you wouldn't do in real life because I'm covered in germs, but you can do it to that. Oh, Ryan, thank you. For Great, we just hired a new guy. His name is Kenny, and Kenny's. So fun. Now was fun. You're great.